Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Join me as I seek out the small incremental changes being applied in other industries that we can learn from and that can be applied in healthcare. Can these changes bring immediate value, but also add up to the big improvements and revolution we need in healthcare? Come along with me to explore the possibilities. My innovative guests from around the globe have used small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. And today, I'm delighted to be joined by Kelvin Coleman. He is the Executive Director of the National Cyber Security Alliance. Kelvin, thanks for joining me today. And Nick, it is a real pleasure to be with you today. Looking forward to it. So uh, for the benefit of the listeners, you have, as uh, many of my guests do, you have an interesting background. You're uh, in a, a highly pertinent role at this point in terms of uh, many of the challenges that we have in cybersecurity. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got here, if you would. You know, I, I still at my heart, I'm a country boy from Blair, South Carolina. Um, you, you know, got the good fortune of getting a, a uh, internship in the governor's office back in South Carolina in my college days. And then, you know, I was able to come to Washington, D.C. and, you know, was working at the Department of uh, Justice and Homeland Security. And uh, my boss came to me, um, this was probably around 2008, 2009, saying, hey, I need you to look at cybersecurity and what the state and local folks are doing. And I said, look at what? <laughs> so it was this uh, real journey uh, over the past 12, 13 years where I find myself now. Uh, so I feel very, very fortunate. I, I tell people I'm sort of the Forrest Gump of cybersecurity, right? Just find myself in these wonderful situations, talking to wonderful people. Uh, certainly today's company is included in, in talking to you. Well, I, I appreciate that. I think that's a, a wonderful analogy and, and visual for people to uh, connect with you and, and your background. So let's get to the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And for those of you that are interested uh, the Twitter handle is Stay Safe Online. I think important to follow. You know, there's some great work going on. Tell us a little bit about that, the formation and your role there. You know, Nick, the National Cybersecurity Alliance is the ultimate team game. Uh, it's certainly, you know, we ha we couldn't do it without the team of folks we have in the private sector as well as uh, government. On the private sector side, we have about 30 board member companies. Uh, they represent about 7.8 trillion, that's what a T, trillion dollars in market cap. Uh, these board member companies are keenly interested in making sure, you know, Americans and increasingly our global community understands cybersecurity. They see it as a, not only a, a, a good thing to do, but they see it as a business case as well, a more cyber literate customer is a better customer, a more trusting customer, a longer lasting uh, customer. And so they want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to educate, uh, again, the global community on cybersecurity. Give you a perfect example. On our board, we have Discover, MasterCard, Visa, and American Express. They're all fierce competitors in the marketplace, you know, as well as they should be. Uh, but around the board table of the NCSA family, they're working together to make sure that uh, folks understand uh, how to protect themselves and how to protect their community, you know, and, and so that's a real great example of kind of how we work together. And on the government side, uh, we work primarily with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. Many of your li listeners probably began to really know a lot more about CISA during the fall elections. They played a very key role in making sure that our 2020 elections were secure. In fact, I think Chris Krebs paid a price for that, uh, being successful. Ironically enough. And, and so, you know, we work with them uh, on an almost daily basis. Uh, so the National Cybersecurity Alliance, we do what we do because of our partners. We do what we do because of the team first, you know, uh, mission that we have. Uh, so very proud of that public-private partnership that we've built over the years. So it's interesting you talk about, you know, what our fierce competitors, uh, you know, that sit in your uh, environment, but work together. And they're drawn to this and they're drawn to the direction that you've taken because ultimately damage in one instance damages them all through, I, I guess, I, I, I'm trying to think of the word, but it's sort of, you know, it, 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 if somebody causes disruption in one area, it impacts them all. Is is that been the experience? Is that what sort of helped drive that partnership? Oh, absolutely. I, I think they understand that 
they share many of the same customers, right? Um, you know, I mean, I don't know how many credit cards you have in your uh, wallet, Nick, but I, I got a few of those folks in my wallet. <laughs> and I think they realize that and, and they've come to the conclusion. And by the way, we have, you know, like I said, 25, 26 other members. You know, you think about Bank of America, U.S. Bank, Wells Fargo. They compete on a daily basis, yet they sit around the table uh, at the National Cybersecurity Alliance as a family. And to your point, they all recognize that, uh, you know, we either hang together or hang separately, right? We have to be able to uh, work together to, you know, bring education and awareness to, uh, again, uh, America, but more increasingly, uh, the world. They want to see people be uh, cyber literate and, and, and protect themselves. So it's absolutely in their best interest to do this together. And and, and the collective is always more powerful than the singular, right? Um, you, you know, so they've realized that coming around our table, not, we're not not for profit. We we try to keep our good housekeeping still of approval, Nick, in terms of, you know, we don't take a stand in terms of one product being better than the other. Uh, not at all. What we do take a stand on is that uh, we want everyone to uh, you know, engage in this continuously connected society as safely and securely as possible. So I, I think anybody that listens to my show and, and knows me knows that I'm, I'm extraordinarily passionate about this. I mean, this is a core problem. It represents itself in so many facets, not just in the banking and the credit card. We see this extraordinary sort of uh, impact on the individual in all sorts of ways. And, and one of the ones that is very current is the whole level of information around vaccines and the poor sharing of data and in fact this extraordinary jump in on the part of these individuals to essentially use this uh, challenging time to grab people and cause all sorts of mischief. How do you go about dealing with this? You know fortunately and unfortunately Nick this is not a new phenomenon right in terms of bad actors taking advantage of a horrible situation. Uh, you look at the last pandemic, you know, in the 19, early 1900s, when the country went through this, you know, if you're so inclined, you can go back and look at newspaper advertisements where, you know, they're putting out literally, that's where sort of snake oil concept came from, literally, uh, you know, saying, hey, here's a special oil that you can rub to get rid of, you know, the, the flu. Uh, of course, we know that wasn't true, but bad actors have always taken advantage of bad situations. And in this particular case, what I try to tell people is they're simply using technology today uh, to further their aims. Now, you know, you, you, in, in 1980, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, they put out a counterterrorism report, Nick, that said small, organized, and technically proficient groups will be able to confront and overcome current standing nations. What they predicted in 1980 was that, you know, if you are really good in technology, uh, you can even the playing field. And that's what we're seeing today with bad actors, be it nation states, be it nation state sponsored organizations, uh, being, be it lone actors who are just simply doing it for the financial gain. Uh, so it's really unfortunate, but not surprising that they're taking full advantage of COVID-19 pandemic uh, to further their malicious aims. So if you think about that fact, do, do you have a sense of the proportion of organized aspects of this versus just sort of, I don't want to say lone, I mean, there are sort of sure. banded together groups, but, you know, how does that break down? Is it mostly small groups or is there a lot of large, I mean, it feels like it's a business in some instances. Oh, it is a business. It, it, it doesn't seem like a, it is a, I was going to say a legitimate business, but legitimate from the, <laughs> yeah, it's not legitimate at all, Nick, uh, but it's organized. I, I can say that. These folks are extraordinarily organized, extraordinarily sophisticated um, in technology. I think the mistake is to say that, oh, well, they, they're just kind of, you know, uh, messing around and trying to be opportunists and pick up where they can. Not true at all. They understand technology, these cyber malicious actors. And in terms of what kind of organizations they're coming from, kind of hard to tell sometimes, right? Uh, if they're sponsored by someone or if they're just in it for themselves. Uh, but most of the time, what they're stealing in terms of information, 
uh, you know, we know it ends up on the dark web. I mean, I can go right now and buy pieces of folks, their information, as you know all too well, Nick, or, you know, buy the whole thing, right? Get it a la carte or I can get the buffet. Um, you, and, and so when we talk about, you know, what who they're part of in terms of groups and things of that nature, kind of hard to tell sometimes. But I can tell you this, they are well, well organized. Uh, these are not opportunists by any means. Uh, they're folks who are extraordinarily targeted and know their stuff. They do their background. When they send a ransom, <laughs> you know, where uh, to, you know, a, a city or hospital or education system, generally speaking, Nick, as you know, they're not asking for, you know, astronomical amounts of money, right? They're asking for some sweet spot that they've done research and said, you know what, Baltimore City can pay $400,000, right? We're not going to ask for $400 million. Never get it. But let's ask for that sweet spot. And so that tells us they do their research. They know what they're doing. Very sophisticated. I, it just blows my mind. I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking, you must have economists essentially <laughs> working to decide what that sweet spot is of the, this is, I think they're going to pay this, but they won't pay that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's shocking. So terrible circumstance. I will link into the blog post, I, I think, an extraordinary a uh, well done video that chases some of these folks down, um, you know, shows the level of organization well worth the sort of 20 minutes. And and indeed, it's entertaining. It includes glitter bombs, which I find right, right. fascinating. Yes. <laughs> but I, as we talk about this, I think what I really want to hear is what can we do about it? What can we help to sort of combat this? What What is your group doing? Yeah, I, you know, as as it may not sound very exciting or sexy, but Again, education and awareness. And, and history is on our side here. Uh, you know, if I say Smokey the Bear, most people would say only you could prevent forest fires, right? That was a public service announcement. That was a campaign that put it into the consciousness of people that, yeah, I have a part to play in uh, mitigating, you know, fires. Uh, and, and so let me play, play my part. You know, my dad often reminds me that, you know, growing up, Seat belts were not a big thing for him in his generation, but people were dying in car accidents that were completely preventable if they had on their seat, as my dad would say, harness, uh, you know, that, that seat belt. Well, a public service announcement, you know, early 70s or so came out, hey, wear your seat belt. It saves lives. You know, we can go down the line, you know, smoking or DUI or, you know, these public service announcements that bring education and awareness to people to make them you know, realize that I play a part. The National Cybersecurity Alliance, we're leading the national public service announcement, right, on cybersecurity, what people can do to protect themselves. And just like the seatbelt campaign, you know, relatively low-hanging fruit things you could do. Seatbelt campaign, just click it. That, that's all you have to do at the National Cybersecurity Alliance. We're encouraging people to do three simple things, right? Have a robust and thorough alphanumeric password, right? Uh, enable multi-factor authentication where you can and make sure your mach machine is patched. Doesn't That's not going to cost you a whole lot at all, uh, Nick, to be able to do those things. Uh, to, to Now, will that guarantee that you're protected against uh, criminals? Not by any stretch of the imagination, but it does guarantee you're less likely of a target than those people who will not do those things. So for those of you just joining, I'm Dr. Nick, the incrementalist. Today, I'm joined, to, joined by Calvin Coleman. He is the executive director of the National Cyber Security Alliance. We were just talking about the mitigation methods. Calvin was just uh, talking about, uh, you know, the three factors, you know, you're advocating, I think, simplifying it as much as possible. And, you know, the analogy that I have relative to that is, you know, it, it's not 100 percent, but you know, when it came to the car alarms, that didn't stop people from breaking in, but it sure as hell made them walk past your car to another car. I mean, that, and that's okay, you know, if you're going to, you want to minimize this and make it as hard as possible. So yeah, yeah. Some great advice there with robust passwords, I think multi-factor authentication and right. make sure that your machines are patched so they have the latest in terms of uh, updates. So... I, as I think about this, those are all sort of, you know, great uh, elements, but a lot of this boils down to people. And we, we were talking before uh, about Smokey the Bear. Now, I didn't grow up with that um, outside of this country, but I do recognize it. And, you know, I can relate. 
What's the same principle here for cybersecurity? Do you have a sort of message that is as simple as that for uh, folks to really get them engaged? Yeah, we, we, we last year started a campaign, uh, hashtag uh, be smart, uh, do your part, be cyber smart, right? Uh, and with that, right, and, and sort of what does that say to people? Well, you know, probably not much when they're just uh, listening to it for the first time. But behind that, uh, we provide a number of resources, tools that individuals, families, communities uh, can use to protect themselves. So do your part, be cyber smart. Each link in the chain means something. So, you know, if if someone gets a, a, a malware, uh, you know, a, successful malware attack against their machine that accesses now their contacts and, and their address book. Well, you've now exposed other people, right? Not even meaning to, but you have. And so be, do your part, be cyber smart is both an individual thing and a community thing. Do your part, right? Uh, to be cyber smart for the entire community. That's what we're doing now. One important thing, Nick, that we did last year, every October we celebrate National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Well, for the first time last year, we dropped the national on it and we started celebrating Cybersecurity Awareness Month uh, because we just felt putting national in the front gave the indication that this is just an American thing or just one country. No, no, no. This is a global phenomenon. And so uh, through Cybersecurity Awareness Month, we use that as our, hey, that's our World Cup of, of football, right? We want to make sure folks have eyes on cybersecurity at that time. But Nick, we also enjoy cybersecurity so much, we invented a, a, a celebration called Identity Management Day, uh, celebrated the second Tuesday of every April. You know, this is the first annual celebration this year, uh, you know, and, and, and we're so excited about it. We uh, created this holiday with the uh, National Defined Security Alliance, uh, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, culmination of a lot of effort to bring, um, um, you know, to, to bring access or, or to bring sort of attention to identity management, which, as you know, is so important. Uh, you know, the majority of successful attacks come through compromised identity, uh, you know, be it credentials or anything else. And so, uh, so we created Identity Management Day. And one last thing, Data Privacy Day in in January, January 28th. Uh, and so we use these opportunities to really bring awareness to people and make sure they understand, again, not only understand the issue, but how to protect themselves. Yeah, I, and I, you know, I, I personally have a passion around this because my identity, whilst not, well, it has been stolen, let's be clear. Uh, it's been stolen to essentially scam other folks mm. uh, in the dating applications. I have had now... I can trace five individuals that have reached out to me to say, is this really you that's uh, stuck wow. in uh, Afghanistan? I, you know, a number of places. And what they did was took elements of my story, pictures of me, and then created this fake profile. So I, I can't tell you. One of the challenges I've had is I, I don't know how to combat that. I can't even get yeah. to the original right. sources. So um, you know, I think awareness is the most important thing that really sort of comes out of this. So going forward, I mean, this is, you know, it's interesting you date it back to 1918 because that's, you know, been very topical with the vaccines and everything. And, you know, the challenge with this pandemic, it, it's clearly going to be an ongoing problem. We've mm -hmm. even seen artificial intelligence used by some of the perpetrators of this. They're using the same technology as we are to combat it. What's the future hold? How do we, is there a point in time where we can actually combat this and it becomes a much smaller problem, do you think? Yes, for sure. Uh, I, fantastic. I'm, okay. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very, very confident of that because at one point, you know, again, someone may have said, well, how can we combat, you know, people dying on the highway? It's their right to drive and not to put on that seatbelt. Well, awareness made them sort of realize that, no, 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 we can do something about this. We, we can help each other out. And then, by the way, we have to do this, Nick, because five years ago, probably about 15 billion connected devices around the globe. Today, about 20 billion connected devices. So that's about a 33% a increase, a very healthy increase, by the way, over the last five years to go from 15 billion to 20 billion. In the same amount of time, Nick, in the next five years, 
going to be at least 60 billion connected devices around the world. That's a 300% increase, a threefold increase. And so we're going to go from the Internet of Things to the Internet of Everything. Artificial intelligence, conversational platforms, brain-computer interface. And so this explosion that we've seen in the last 20 years in technology is going to pale in comparison to the next 20. My point there, you may say, well, yeah, that gives more opportunity for the perpetrators. Not, no, no, I, I refuse to believe that because I think awareness, awareness, awareness is going to be the key to make sure that folks understand how to use their devices safely and securely. The last thing I'll say is that in terms of focusing on people, that's always been undervalued in technology. But now there's a realization that, no, 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 people still count. There are products, there are processes, and there are people. And we think that last piece is so very important. If you only look at the how the bad actors have you know, historically performed in the very beginning of the technology revolution, they were attacking products. They were trying to back in uh, some vulnerability in the software or take advantage of some you know, hardware uh, you know, vulnerability. And then they started attacking processes, right? Well, let me send an email to the executive assistant of the CFO uh, to say the CEO needs this check. Well, they attacked that process and we got smart there. Well, now they're attacking people now we are finally focusing on people. When you talk about you know spear fishing or whale fishing or you know just fishing in general, now we're at that point where no, no, people still count. And certainly that's what we're doing at the National Cybersecurity Alliance along with our partners and private and, and public sector partners. So do you think that I, 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 and you know, I'm not naive enough to say that we've solved the problem, but do you think that the majority of that product side has been resolved to, to a sufficient degree. And I'll, I'll give you a, a specific example around that. So many defaults mm-hmm. are set, you know, our, our sort of position on security and products is, oh, just make it wide open, you know, put in your dishwasher and it's connected to the internet. Well, that's not a problem. Well, guess what? Vegas found out that the fish tank was a problem because they used that as a port of entry. Do you think we've gotten there or we still got some ways to go? I certainly don't want to draw the raft of some of my board members who make some of these wonderful products. Uh, but I think even they would say, we got a little bit more ways to go, right? Uh, you know, I don't think there's no, no harm, no filing saying that. Um, the If you look at the pandemic itself, you know, Nick, and of course, if you've been a doctor, you understand all too well that at the beginning of the pandemic, it was about accessibility. So healthcare technology was certainly coming online But network-enabled point-of-care services and mobile apps, uh, you know, they were just not uh, where they are today. Even in a year, we've leaped far ahead of of where we were. So my my point there is that the the companies recognize that they have to make better products, more secure products. And by the way, this is a business case for them. They want to be known for having secure and safe products because – a part, part of becoming cyber literate is now deciding who you're going to do business with because they're going to protect your information the best. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, back to your original example with seatbelts and, you know, that, that as a sort of model, I, my recollection of that history was it wasn't a feature. It was, you know, this was a pain. Yeah. It was additional cost. Very true. But Very true. I'm pretty sure, and maybe this is a European thing, but I don't know if this translates, but anybody in Europe would be able to say the safest car is and then fill in the gap with the company that focused on that and sort of preempted. And I think that's exactly what you're saying in the cybersecurity world. Uh, as, as that's such a great example. I'm going to steal that, uh, Nick. And, and, you know, and I'll give it, I'll, I'll attribute it to you, though. Uh, so if you think about, you know, that seatbelt being, say, passwords, well, then the evolution of the car, you got the uh, airbag, right? Now, you know, say what you want about airbags, but that may be relative. That may be compared to, say, multi-factor authentication. Right? right, it's that extra layer of protection that keeps you, you know, as safe as possible. Fantastic. Well, as usual, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, I, I, I want to say that I'm just so excited to hear somebody in your position leading this consortium that crosses all of these boundaries of competition, all pulling in the same direction. But the piece I want to pull out specifically was how positive you were that this is 
it's not solved and it's never going to be 100%, but we are absolutely getting to the point where, you know, this is not. So very excited to hear that, excited about the work and just remains for me to thank you for joining me on the show. Dr. Nick, I can't thank you enough for having me. Uh, it's a journey. We'll get there together. Uh, and so, but thank you so very much for having me today. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, The Incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution. <laughs>